Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good. How do we convey the feeling of heat in games? Shades of orange and red that add up to brighter shades of yellow and white read as hot when used in our fire particle systems, but what about objects that aren't straight up engulfed in flame? A vent exhausting warm air, a pot of boiling water, or the heat radiating from the sand warmed by a desert sun? One technique often used to visualize heat in games is to mimic the real-world phenomenon of heat haze, often referred to in games as heat distortion. This is usually a subtle effect in real life caused by hot objects warming the nearby air while air slightly further away is several degrees cooler, creating a gradient in the index of refraction. But we're making video games, so let's forget about the pesky science and just crank that boy up to 11. Heat distortion was actually an effect I mentioned in one of my earliest videos, Shaders 102, and just like we did back then, we'll implement the effect using post-processing. Now that video was made about three years ago, and so naturally, Unity has matured three years since then. There are now more advanced ways of building post-process effects, specifically integrating them into Unity's post-process stack v2. So this video is going to be about two things, a general technique for creating heat distorting effects, and building custom post-process effects that extend Unity's post-effects stack. Let's start with the technique itself. Our end goal is that we want to take the final result of our render that looks something like this and distort the pixels around a hot area like this. We'll write a post process that takes in the main color buffer as well as another render texture containing information about how to distort the image. First, we'll sample the distortion texture. If we create this buffer as an RG float buffer, the red and green values we sample will represent full 32-bit precision floats. These floats will be treated as the number of texels we want to distort the image by at this fragment, so we'll need to multiply the red value by 1 over the main texture's width and the green value by 1 over the main texture's height. In Unity, these reciprocal width and height values are pre-computed and provided as a uniform like this. So in our case, they'll be in the X and Y components of a uniform named main text texel size. Now we can sample the main texture, offsetting the sampled UV using our distortion value, and return the result. A quick note while we're in here, we're seeing some macros defined by the post-process stacks include files. These are recommended to use by Unity over the slightly old school method of defining a sampler 2D yourself and calling text2D directly. It just allows Unity's shader compilation to conditionally make your shader work on more platforms automagically, which is always nice. Now that we know where we want to end up, let's start creating that render texture containing the distorting data. I mentioned before that we'll want to use the RG float format. This means we'll create a render texture with 64 bits per pixel, 32 bits for the red channel and 32 for green. Red represents X distortion and green represents Y distortion. Each frame will clear this distortion texture's color, zeroing out its red and green values. Then we'll render some stuff into the texture that creates interesting distortions. There's a bit of freedom in how we do this, but here's what I've done. Sample some normal map, in this case I generated one from the grayscale smoke texture used in the scene. Unpack those normal map values so that they're in the range negative 1 to 1. Note that I'm using Unity's unpack method here, again to automatically keep things working cross-platform. More specifically, this method handles odd packings of certain compression formats for normal maps like in DirectX. One nice feature to support here is to bring along the alpha value from the vertex color. That way, particle systems and sprite renderers used as distortion effects can transition in and out nicely. The final color value we'll return is the unpacked normal red and green values multiplied by the blue value and the vertex alpha. And for good measure, we'll provide a magnitude factor so we can really punch up our distortions when we need to. Because we're writing to a floating point render texture, we can write negative red and green values directly into the texture without them being clamped to zero. This is especially cool because it means that we can additively blend these distortion particles and we'll get some interesting behavior of complement distortions cancelling each other out. So to reiterate, our strategy for creating a buffer containing distortions will be to create an RG float render texture, set it as the render target, then render our distortion particles from the same perspective as the rendering camera into our distortion texture. Excuse this interruption, but won't this strategy have an issue due to the lack of Z-culling? 
Distorting particles which should be occluded by objects in the scene will be drawn into the distortion texture despite the aforementioned occlusion. You're absolutely correct, vaguely British Unity developer. If we hooked everything up now, we would see odd behavior when a distorting particle is occluded. Because we're using this separate render texture, we don't have a depth buffer bound which will discard fragments based on their depth. We've got a couple of options here. We could make some sort of Frankenstein render texture where we bind the color buffer of our RG float texture and the depth buffer of our scene render, then rendering our distorting effects. Or we could use the main scene's depth information as a depth texture and make it available to our distortion particle shader. Then we could manually perform Z culling in the fragment shader and possibly do a technique like soft particles if we wanted to. In this video, we'll opt for the second technique because it will let us do something else cool later on. The vertex shader will now need to pass along the vertex depth and projective texture coordinates to sample the scene depth texture. In the fragment shader, we'll sample the depth texture using the projection corrected texture coordinate and use Unity's decode eye depth macro to remap the sampled value into the camera's depth range, the same range we just encoded the particle Z value into in the vertex shader. Now we can create a culling value by comparing those two values. When the scene is closer to the eye, the value will be zero, otherwise it will be one. We can multiply our final result by this cull value, a voila. We've recreated Z culling in our fragment shader. If you're suspicious of this and think we should have tried to use the depth information that was already available to let the GPU handle Z culling in its preferred way, consider this cool thing we can do now. Our distortion texture doesn't have to be the same size as our scene's color buffer, a requirement we would have to meet to use the depth buffer directly. We're committing to 64 bits per pixel, but that doesn't mean we have to commit to an extra 16 megabyte render texture. We can also get some performance gains on fill rate by drawing our distortion effects at a lower resolution. Even having the width and height of the distortion buffer's render target gives us some pretty nice wins. So that's the technique. Now let's go about integrating it with Unity's post-process stack. In past videos, we've used techniques involving multiple cameras and render textures, making use of the on render image camera callback. Things often felt a bit flimsy and introduced weird project specific scene and camera setups. The post-process stack relies on Unity's command buffer approach to rendering and submitting draw calls instead of stitching together several draw calls and cameras with various scripts. In my experience, if you lean into the use of command buffers, life gets a lot simpler, and we can avoid the complexities involving specific camera, layer, and script setups that might not work for all projects. So here's the high-level approach we'll go for. Objects in the scene which render distortion effects will have a component attached to them, which when enabled registers them with a small manager class. Our custom post-process effect will be passed a command buffer from the post-process stack, which it needs to fill with its rendering logic. It will first add a command to create a temporary buffer, then a command to bind that texture as the active render target, and then another command to clear the active target's color. With our render target ready to be drawn to, we can now fill the command buffer with commands that draw all the registered renderers in our manager. And finally, we can add a command that blitz the source to the destination using our post-process shader. Let's dig into the post-process effect code and see how all this comes together. The first thing we'll see in the file is a serializable class that defines the properties of our effect. It's decorated with an attribute defining it as a post-process effect, with an effect renderer, an enum which controls at which point in the stack the effect will render, and finally, a path for adding the effect to a post-process volume. The body of the class has a few serializable properties wrapped in some fancy generic parameter classes. Suffice it to say, following this pattern will ensure Unity is able to properly serialize your properties. We'll include a global magnitude we can use to blend the entire effect in or out as we like, as well as our downscale factor, and a toggle for debugging our effect. Next, let's look over the effect renderer class itself. This part of the code is most similar to the old school mono behavior that gets attached to the camera, except rather than derive from mono behavior, it derives from a generic typed post process effect renderer class, which specifies the data the effect is provided from whatever post process volume the effect is added to. There are a number of virtual methods we can override here to make our effect do stuff. The first two we see are get camera flags and init. The former allows us to declare our effect requires a camera to provide either the depth texture or the depth normals texture. The latter is a place to cache some values and grab resources we'll need in our render method. And at last we come to the render method, 
The new hotness in Unity, which when used in ideal circumstances, removes the need for methods like on pre-render, on pre-cull, on post-render, on render image, and any other mono behavior callbacks we used to use. The render works as follows. It is called with a context, a structure that stores all the relevant data we need to perform our post-process effect, including the source render texture, the destination, the camera, and other helpful values like whether this context represents the scene view. Oh, by the way, writing our post-process effects this way will make them work in the scene view, so... The render starts by getting a property sheet. This is a wrapper for a material and a material property block that can be pooled and reused, and gives us a nicer way of toggling shader keywords if we need to. Then we fill the command buffer inside the context object with all the commands needed to render our effect. The final command you add should usually be some form of blit, from the context source texture to the context destination texture. If you were to omit this step, you'll likely break the stack and end up drawing nothing or garbage to the screen. Unlike the old ways of writing post-process effects, we're not making GL calls immediately. Instead, we're prepping a buffer that Unity will strategically fit into its render pipeline. And speaking of render pipelines, writing our post-process effects using the modern, albeit more complex style, should make our effects compliant with scriptable render pipelines. Admittedly, I haven't tested this effect with the lightweight render pipeline or the HD render pipeline yet, but if you try it, let me know how it works. When all is said and done, we can start making our distortion particle effects. Making sure that our camera has a post-process layer and is affected by a post-process volume with our distortion effect added to it, we can author particle systems that use the distortion particle shader we created earlier. Remember, we'll need to add our distortion effect component to the particle system so that it gets registered with the manager. The ability to see our particles distorting things while editing in the scene view will make the lives of artists much easier as compared to janky setups that require the game view or worse for the game to be in play mode. With the debug view, we simply omit the setup of the distortion texture and let the distortion effects draw directly to the main color buffer so that we can visualize distortions in the world. The fire in our scene is certainly looking a heck of a lot spicier thanks to the distortion, but we're not limited to just creating heat with this effect. In Overwatch, for example, have you ever noticed the streaking trail of blurred lines behind Soldier 76 as he runs? Or the way Widowmaker lets out a glass-shattering sound wave when she's sniping? Both effects could be achieved using a technique like this. Well, that does it for this episode of Making Stuff Look Good. I think I promised a channel update last time I made a video. Let's see, um, six months ago. Ah, oh, jeez, I, I really gotta make more of these. <laughs> For now, I'll just try to get a video out slightly more regularly than every six months and save the channel update for a rainy day. The project and the code used in this video is available on GitHub. The stylish 3D assets featured in the video are by the legendary Kenny. Links to where you can download them and more great assets are in the description. Thank you to my wonderful patrons for your continued support. You the best. And as always, thank you all for watching. Keep on making those video games.